So we are in week two of an Advent series called Christmas is Forgiving, and we're taking a deeper look at the meaning of Christmas. What's it all about from the biblical perspective? Uh, Christmas tends to be a time when people go crazy, right? Particularly with shopping. I, I know I was out yesterday uh, shopping. I almost got into three car accidents, and that was all in the Target parking lot because uh, like, people have lost their minds, right? But they, and they lost their minds about what we shop for, too. I, I heard one person put it this way. Christmas is when you buy this year's gifts with all of next year's money. You know, like I don't recommend that at all, but that's what a lot of people do uh, because Christmas is about gifts. And it's, it's a weird birthday celebration. I mean, Christmas is a celebration of the birth of Christ, and yet we celebrate his birthday by giving each other gifts, which is, you know, weird. And I used to think this must be the only, as a kid, I thought that this, Jesus must be mad. Like this has got to be the worst birthday in the world, you know, where it's your birthday and everybody else gets presents. That, that must be the only birthday in the world where that happens. Then I became an adult and got married and had kids. And now I'm like, oh, that's actually not that unusual. But uh, for many Christians, uh, Christmas is, or for many people, Christmas is about getting. It's about what you're going to receive at Christmas. And now I know uh, nobody in this room, you're way too mature. It's all the other services that are caught up with all that, you know, getting presents. But I just want to, just in case, I just want to absolve everybody. Wanting Christmas presents is not a bad thing, okay? In fact, I want you to turn to the person next to you and tell them what you want for Christmas this year. So turn to somebody around you, tell them what you want for Christmas. Go. All right, uh, those of you who are sitting by your spouse, you're welcome. You now know what to get them, and so write that down. Uh, and if your spouse, just, just a hint, if your spouse said, oh, honey, I don't want anything, they're lying. So get them something uh, and, and, and figure it out. But uh, uh, some people are hard to shop for. Anybody got anybody in your life hard to shop for? My wife is impossible to shop for. Um, and it's because one of her spiritual, like her love languages is gifts. And when you have the love language of gifts, you just like getting gifts. So you have like a lot of things you want. And so I have a hard time narrowing down which gift is going to make her feel most special. My wife has a hard time shopping for me for completely different reasons. And maybe you're married to someone more like myself. Uh, I'm the spouse who never wants anything. And when I do want something, it's ridiculously expensive. Anybody married to that person? Uh, so I'm sorry for you. I, I can't help myself. It's either nothing or a car. That's like the world that I live in. I don't know. Uh, or, or a motorcycle, an Indian motorcycle. Oh, Lord Jesus. Okay. Anyway, back on, back on track. Uh, so, oh, um, but that's actually how you define a great gift because see, I want to give her these gifts because I care so much about her. I want it to be special. I want it to, to last. And the problem though is these things that you've just got to have. Isn't it amazing how quickly it goes from got to have it to garage sale? I mean, like, does anybody remember the gifts they got last year? I, I, I know I got socks and underwear because I get them every year, but beyond that, I have no idea. I don't remember my Christmas gifts. And that's how you judge a good gift. The, the, the ultimate gift, the, the holy grail of Christmas gifts is the gift that keeps on giving. giving. Yeah, that's right. It's the ultimate thing at Christmas. It's a gift that will last, that continues to impact. It's something that maybe I don't even know that I need or that I want, but the one who loves me just knows me so well that they know that I need this thing. And it, and it doesn't ever get old. It just, you never gets cast aside because it, it just meets such a deep felt need. Well, the reason that we celebrate Christmas is because God gave us one of those gifts. Christmas really is for getting. It's for the greatest gift ever received, given to mankind. And we're gonna talk about that gift. Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter nine. Uh, if you're using one of our Bibles, we'll be on page 409. Uh, if you would like to use one of our Bibles, just raise your hand. The ushers will bring you one. Uh, and if you don't own a Bible, just keep this as a gift to you. Merry Christmas. Um, we're going to talk about the greatest gift ever given. It's a gift that never gets old. It's a gift that has been affecting the world for centuries. Uh, it's a gift described in Isaiah chapter 9 set by this prophet 700 years before the gift was given and yet describing it perfectly. So Isaiah chapter 9, starting with verse 2. It says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as uh, people rejoice at harvest or like warriors dividing the plunder. 
For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift a heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. So this is kind of setting the stage for the gift that's about to come. And, and he starts out and he says, those in darkness will see a great light. Now what he's talking about there is the end of something called the intertestamental period. So there, that's just a really fancy word for saying when the Old Testament ended, before the New Testament began, there was a gap of 400 years. And during that 400 years, God ultimately just didn't, he didn't speak much. And, and people were longing to hear the voice of God. And he's saying, hey, if you've been living in this time of darkness, it's about to get much, much brighter. He talks about things like rejoicing, dividing plunder, breaking the yoke of slavery, lifting the burden. He's saying, hey, listen, I know it looks bad now. It's about to get better. Restoration is coming. The gift that God is sending is going to change everything. And he gives us a couple great pictures of this gift. First, it won't be wrapped the way you think. He refers to a story, he refers to the army of Midian. And this, re this refers to an Old Testament story you may or may not have heard. Uh, Gideon had to take his army up against the army of Midian, and they were way, way outnumbered. And God still says to him, hey, your army's way too big. And he, through a series of events, he whittles Gideon's army down to 300 men. And Gideon is, there's no way we can do this. And God says, okay, that's okay, you're not going to fight him. Here's what I want you to do. Go to their camp tonight, surround the camp with torches, and I want you to yell and play trumpets. Like, that's the plan. So they're out there, and they're like, ah, 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 and, and everybody in the camp goes crazy, kills each other. Isaiah refers back to this picture in order to, to tell us this message. Deliverance is coming in an unlikely way. When this gift comes, it's going to seem insignificant, but do not overlook it. The second picture we see here is that this gift will bring about peace. Verse 5 talks about military equipment no longer be needed. He's like, throw your boots and your uniforms and everything, your weapons, just throw them on the fire. They're just, they're just firewood now because it's going to be a time of peace. So when you combine these things, you combine like there's going to be this really amazing gift that's going to seem insignificant and it's going to bring about peace. Now everybody's like, huh, I can't wait to see this gift. This is going to be pretty awesome. And then he keeps describing it and they're not so sure. Verse 6. For a child is born to us. A child? A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. So this begins to describe something they weren't expecting. The first thing they learn about this gift is that God's gift is more personal than ever imagined. They just weren't expecting this. It says, he says right there, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us. Now, we know great gifts are personal. I mean, we, we understand that we want a gift that shows that the giver was involved and that they understand us and that they know our needs. Listen, giving your son to die for somebody else, that's about as personal as it gets. And, and this is what's going to happen. And the pro it was prophesied for, for years and years and years, but Jesus comes and they miss it in large part because they weren't expecting God to be so personal. They expected a king, a Messiah, you know, you know but they weren't looking for, for God to get his hands dirty. They were never expecting a suffering servant. No one expected God to get vulnerable. And yet he did. He got very personal because it was very personal to him. So the eternal enters the earthly. Heaven enters into humanity and becomes one of us. In John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it says, this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. God so loved the world, he so loved you, he so loved me, that he gave his only son. He gave us an opportunity to be redeemed. He gave us a choice. You can follow me or not. But he looked down, he saw you, and he said, worth it, worth it. And he gave everything. So this gift couldn't be more personal, and it was way more personal than they ever could have imagined. The second thing they found out is that God's gift is more powerful than ever imagined. It's right there in that name. It says the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called, and then it lists all these names. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
Now, we're all, in Scripture, there are no wasted words, and names are particularly important. Always in Scripture, do you, names tend to mean something. Now, that's not necessarily true in our society. Any more uh, names either don't have a lot of meaning or parents don't consider the meaning when they name their son. For example, I'm named Phil. Phil means lover of horses. Okay? Now, listen, I don't have anything against horses. Horses and I are copacetic right? We're good, but I don't love horses. You know, my parents didn't look at me, you know, when I was adopted and they, I was first placed in their arms. They didn't look at me and go, man, he looks like he loves horses. Like that, that was not their thought process. They just went, we want to name him Phil. We like the name Phil. We like the sound. They didn't think about the meaning. That would never have happened in scripture ever. Okay. Names meant something. So like Eve, for instance, Adam and Eve, Eve means mother of all living. Okay. That's what it means. Abraham, father of the multitudes, father of nations. So when this scripture says he will be called, everyone would have been like leaning in. Listen up, because what, what is about to happen is they're, they're about to tell you that the gift, and they're about to tell you the nature and the character of the gift. And the first thing that we learn is that he's called Wonderful Counselor. Literally, Pele Yats in the Hebrew. It's two thoughts put together. Pele means beyond understanding and comprehension. Yats means to advise, consult, or guide. So the first description is that you're going to have a child who is beyond comprehension, who's going to draw near to us and guide us. He's going to be our counselor, but not a counselor in the way we think of counselors today. A counselor in that at the time of the kings of Israel, they would surround themselves with wise men to give them sage advice. That's what God is sending us. He's sending us someone to walk alongside us and tell us the right way to go. In fact, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, In Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's who he's sending us. He's sending us a wonderful counselor and guide. The second name he gives us is Mighty God. The Hebrew is El Gibber. El meaning Jehovah God or Emmanuel, God with us. He, this child is God in the flesh. And then Gibber has three meanings, hero, warrior, champion. So this, this child is, is the hero they're waiting for, the warrior that's come to fight their battles, and the champion of the people. Now, I don't know, maybe you're struggling to see God that way because you're looking around right now and you're like, man, all the pain and suffering in the world, like all the, the wars and famine and natural disasters. I mean, we had a, a huge disaster in our own community this week, and you look at the hurt and the pain and, and you go, Jesus, where's your power? I mean, maybe in your life right now, you're struggling with, you know, loss of job, loss of loved one, your family's falling apart, you're struggling with addiction, swallowed up by loneliness, and you're, you're sitting here in Christmas, you know, celebrating the mighty God, and you're like, God, I don't, where's your power? And here's what Jesus is saying to the church. You're there, aren't you? I mean, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, for God is working in who? In you. He's giving you the desire and the power to do what? To do what pleases him. Here's what we need to understand about Jesus' power. God did not send Jesus to make life easy. He sent Jesus to make us new. That's why he sent him. He sent Jesus with the power to change us from self-centered to selfless, from sinner to servant, from who you are to who God made you to be so that you can then go out and make the world a better place. The third description he gives us is everlasting father. Everlasting is just, you know, perpetual with no beginning or end. And so what we understand is that this is a picture of something we call, in, in, at Christmas, we call the incarnation. It's God taking on flesh. It's, it's, it's the eternal God, the, the Son of God, taking on human flesh. But then the other part, Father, maybe that's a harder pill to swallow for you. You know, if you've got a really great father, a dad, celebrate it. If, if, you know, if he's still around, tell him. Go, call him tonight and be like, Dad, I'm so glad. Because the truth is many don't have that. Far too many, dad was either cruel or distant or angry or just not there, just absent. The problem is we begin to project that image of God onto the everlasting father. And we begin to look at him through that distorted lens. and We get a distorted lens of who God is, who his son Jesus is. Now, here's the truth. This scares me to death as a father. Any, any dads in here ever mess up? Okay. I, good, a few of you. Um, some of you mess up because you're liars. Um, <laughs> I, I mess up all the time, and, and I have to, you know, apologize to my kids. I'm, you know, I, 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 I let them down. I blow it, and, and I, I, I think about, I don't want my kids, because I have failed my kids, I don't want my kids thinking Jesus will too. 
So to train them or to allow them to look at God through the earthly father lens is very dangerous. So I would, I would help you understand, our heavenly fathers, I'm excuse me, our earthly fathers are not a reflection of our heavenly father. Our heavenly father shows us how far our earthly fathers fall short. So I would encourage you to set the father lens down for a second and just look at Jesus through the lens of scripture. Everything God the father was in scripture is in Jesus. Compassion, love, protection, guidance, support. He is our everlasting father. And then my favorite picture, the prince of peace. I love this picture. In Hebrew, it's the Sar Shalom, okay? Sar is the one who's in charge. It would be the, like in, in <clears throat> the Jewish culture, it would be the prince. It's where we get our word czar, okay? Uh, he, he's the one who rules over all. And then there's Shalom. Shalom, the Hebrew meaning is peace, but it means more than peace. It's a, it's a greeting, but it means rest, tranquility, and most importantly, wholeness or completeness. The idea is that through this child, he is the only place you will ever find completeness. You will never be made complete in anyone other than Jesus Christ. He's the Prince of Peace. And you might go, I was absent that day. Like, I didn't get my share of the peace. What's going on? And, and sometimes that's just the case. I mean, life still happens, right? I'm not saying if you, you know, live for Jesus, everything's going to go your way. That's not the case. Peace is not absence of conflict. Peace is peace in the midst of conflict, Right? But many people say, well, I don't have peace. If you don't have peace, I would ask you this question. Where are you standing? Because I want you to picture it this way. The Prince of Peace will cover you with his covering of peace. But we can live in a way that steps outside of that peace, can't we? Or we can step back under it. Like, for instance, if you decide to go home and, you know, have a big fight with your spouse in front of your kids, call them names, and can, can you live in that environment and, and, and that be a place of peace? If you go out after this and you you know, charge up, you have, you're up to debt, you know, and you're up to your eyeballs, and, and yet you go out and charge a bunch of Christmas gifts, and they, can, can you create that, and you can't pay the bills, can you create that environment and, and create a place of peace? Can, can you party every night, sleep around, get drunk, and experience peace? No, because you've chosen to do things that take you out from under the lordship of who Jesus Christ is. When you live under that lordship, I'm not saying everything's great, but you have peace. You remove yourself from that, no peace. So this is the gift that God is giving us, and it's incredible. He, is, he says, I'm going to send my son, and he's going to be the, the everlasting father, wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. He's going to be all these things. And this is where we usually you know, camp at Christmas, and, and we should be in awe of these things, that they're, and rightfully so. They're incredible. But the, if we stop here, we miss part of it. See, he's more personal than ever imagined. The gift is more powerful than ever imagined. But, but if we miss this one, this one's important. God's gift is more permanent than ever imagined. It's more permanent. It, there, there's this really weird phrase in verse 6. I want you to see. It says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders. What's that all about? I did not see Jesus' name on the ballot. If I did, I would have voted for him, and things would turn out differently. Okay, But he wasn't on the ballot. So what, what is this talking about? A child is born to us, a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders. In verse 7 it goes on, it says, His government and its peace will never end. He'll rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. So what does he mean by this? Well, there's another word used for government. Another way to translate that word, it's the word kingdom. I don't want you to miss this. I want you to see this picture. Jesus came to save us from our sins, but his gift is actually bigger than that. Not only did he come to save us from our sins, Jesus also came to establish a kingdom. Our per one of the purposes of this child being born and this son being given was to establish a kingdom of peace and justice. A kingdom that scripture says will last forever. A kingdom that scripture that he describes to Pilate when he stands before Pilate and he says, my kingdom is what? It's not of this world. A kingdom that in Luke 17, he says, is inside believers. A kingdom that gives us access to forgiveness of sin through his death and resurrection. He made possible access to the kingdom of God. And then when he left, guess what? He gave us the keys. There's another name for this kingdom. Do you know what we call it today? We call it the church. We call it the church. The greatest gift that the father ever gave was his son, Jesus. 
And the greatest gift Jesus ever gave was his life to pay the price for our sins. But in giving his life, he was also giving us access to be part of the church, part of the body of believers. Now, throughout history, people have tried to kill the church. They've tried to destroy it. They've tried to ban it. They've tried to silence it. They've tried to outlaw it. But what do we say about a great gift? A great gift is one that lasts that continues to impact. A great gift is a gift that meets such a deep heartfelt need that it does not get shoved aside. It's a gift that I may not even know that I want or need, but the one who loves me knows I need it. And so it never gets pushed aside. Folks, that's what Jesus is. And that's what the church has been for centuries. Jesus created the church to endure and endure it has. Jesus Christ is the greatest gift ever given and the church is his way of ensuring that the gift remains, that the gift still goes. Jesus, the church of Jesus Christ stands as a reminder that God is still on, did you know this in 2016? God is still on the throne. The church of Jesus Christ stands as a reminder that the truth of the gospel is not going anywhere and it is unchanging. The greatest commandment God ever gave us is to, speaks of these, these gifts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Be the church. Christmas is forgetting. We're celebrating the greatest gift that we've ever gotten, we've ever received. We have the gift of his son, Jesus, but we're also celebrating how through the church, through you and me, not the, not these, the building, but you and me, the people sitting in this room, that gift gets to keep on giving. We're celebrating all of these things that he is, wonderful counselor, prince of peace, but we're also celebrating that we get to be part of the church, that the kingdom of God is here on earth, the body of Christ. You're sitting in a physical, and again, not the building, but the people, in a physical representation of the greatest gift God's ever given us. You get to be part of the body of Christ. How exciting is that? We're blessed so that we can be a blessing. That's why Isaiah says, for a child is born to us. Not to me, not to you, but to us, the, to his church. The church is a constant reminder of Jesus and how he came for us. And as we live out our faith in this world, yes, he's still going to act as our guide and our counselor. Yes, he's still empowering us with his strength. He's still connecting us with the Father and he's still covering us with his peace. But in the midst of that, in the midst of him being more personal and more powerful than he could ever imagine, he's more present through the body of Jesus Christ, his local church, so that every time you gather with the body of Christ, every time we come together and worship, every time we lift up his name, every time we celebrate communion, every time you go to your life group, every time you pray with a fellow believer, every time you share your faith, every time you invite somebody, you're being a living, a living re representation of Jesus Christ. Our job as believers is to share the gift of Jesus with others. So this Christmas, if you want to give the greatest gift, invite someone to church. Invite them to Christmas Eve. Get tickets for them tonight. Don't wait. Invite them next week. Say, hey, why don't you come with me to church next week? Invite someone to meet Jesus because that's the gift that we'll keep on giving. Let me pray for you. Father God, you are all of these things. Your son Jesus is wonderful counselor mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and he is all of those things to us. But that's not all there is to the gospel. You have called us to be your ambassadors, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. We are on commission. And my prayer is that we would embrace the fullness of the gospel and we would embrace what it means to be the church, the body of Christ, as we reach this world for you. I pray in your name. Amen.